Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new here, hi, welcome, my name's Georgia and on my platforms here on the internet I focus on unsolved true crime and dark history. Today I have a piece of that dark history for you going back to the 1840s. This involves a large group of people attempting the perilous journey through the Sierra Nevada mountain range, a journey that would end the lives of so many, and the ones that did survive were forced to turn to the greatest of taboos to survive, cannibalism. This is a tale of the lengths people will go to to survive, but at what cost? Should they have been in this position at all? Well, to answer that, we need some of my favourite thing, context. The 1840s were a time of great movement, especially in the USA. The country had only become the United States of America a mere half century beforehand when a huge amount of the population was focused on the East Coast. And with the birth of a new nation, the population grew rapidly, and so did the land area they required. Settlements pushed further and further west, new land was explored. Only, of course, it wasn't new land, it belonged to the Native American tribes, but that was simply not something to get in the way of the American settlers. You see, there was this idea of manifest destiny that was very prevalent at this time. This was basically the idea that the United States was advocated by God to expand its dominion and spread democracy and capitalism across the North American continent. It was basically a justification for forcing Native Americans from their home. I mean, manifest destiny is the definition of American exceptionalism, the belief that American people hold a special place in the world, an idea which does still stand for many Americans today, I would say. And I always get an offended American or two upset at me when I say things like that. I can't judge, I'm British, we've done our fair share of terrible things to the world but you've got to look at history for what it is. History sucks. When the Puritans went over to America from England in the 1630s, they believed that if they survived, it would be a sure sign of God's approval. And then they did survive. They recalled the line in the Bible about be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And the Puritans took that line quite literally with the idea becoming manifest destiny. This idea was only magnified after America gained their independence from Britain in a war that nobody thought America would be able to win. Just another example of American exceptionalism in their eyes, preordained by God. So, in the name of Manifest Destiny, settlers flocked west and throughout the 1840s, thousands of settlers migrated towards California and the Oregon Territory, which was at the time only a territory of the United States inhabited by Native American people. As you can imagine, in a time before cars and planes, the only way to travel west was using wagons. These journeys were long, slow and exhausting. But for the promise of a better life, believing that this was their God-given right, people were willing to make the journey. It also helped in 1848, gold was discovered in the region, leading to the California Gold Rush, and after that point, countless people were lured there with promises of riches beyond their wildest dreams. Depending on where you were starting and where exactly your end destination was, the journey from east to west would take anywhere from four to six months and consisted of very dangerous cross-country travel across the American frontier. It was a relatively easy route for wagons to follow, but the last 100 miles along the California Trail was a pretty perilous journey through the Sierra Nevada mountain range. The range has over 500 distinct peaks over 12,000 feet high, and it snows more than any other mountain range on the continent. So this part of the route was always particularly challenging. Many people did lose their lives. People were always looking for safer alternatives, safer routes, and in 1842, a man called Lansford Hastings published The Emigrant's Guide to Oregon and California, in which he proposed an alternative route to the usual one. Traditionally, people travelled on what was called the Oregon Trail through Snake River Plain, but Lansford proposed that people instead travelled across the Great Salt Lake Desert, which is in present-day Utah. He called it the Hastings Cut-Off, obviously after himself. He thought, or at least he said, this was a more direct route, but unbeknownst to him at the time, it was actually a much longer route, by 125 miles. Lansford stationed himself along the Oregon Trail at the turning point onto his route, so he could persuade travellers to try it out. 
The problem was, he didn't even himself try out the route until 1846, and no one had ever attempted it with wagons. So in this time of great migration, lots of people were heading off to California, and one of these people dreaming of this fresh start was James Fraser Reed. He was a businessman hoping to have more success out west, and he also hoped for a better life for his wife Margaret, who suffered with ill health and terrible headaches. In this time, doctors believed that any woman suffering with ill health could be cured by a nice trip to the seaside and promenades down the beach. Fresh salt air could cure any feminine ailment, apparently. But I suppose that's beside the point. The point was, the Reeds were heading to California, and so were another family called the Donners, George and Tamsin Donner, along with their daughters, Frances, Georgia and Eliza, and also George's daughters from a previous marriage, Aletha and Leanna. The Reed party consisted of James and Margaret and their children, Virginia, Martha Jane, James and Thomas, as well as Sarah Keyes, Margaret's mother. Several members of their extended family also joined, so 32 members in total, along with their employees, so two servants and seven teamsters who drove the wagons. That's a big party, all setting off all together. The party set off from Springfield, Illinois on April 16th, 1846, in a convoy of nine covered wagons first going to Independence, Missouri. They reached Independence around May the 10th to the 12th, where they then stocked up on provisions for their long, long journey ahead. Not long after leaving Independence, they catch up with a group of 50 wagons led by William H. Russell, and they join the rear of this group. There are hundreds, thousands of people making the exact same journey as them. The first victim of the journey would become Margaret's mother on the 29th of May. Now she was already in the advanced stages of consumption tuberculosis and they buried her off the side of the trail, marking her grave with a grey rock inscribed with her name. And then they just had to continue on. By the middle of June, the company had travelled 450 miles in their wagons, with another 200 to go before they reached Fort Laramie in what is now Wyoming. Tamsin Donner wrote a letter to a friend back in Springfield, reading, Indeed, if I do not experience something far worse than what I have yet done, I shall say the trouble is all in getting started. Virginia Reed also said in a letter that she had been perfectly happy during this first part of the trip. They made good time and only had minor delays due to the weather, so in these early days, everything was looking good. They make Fort Laramie safe and sound by the 4th of July, where they celebrate the holiday. Again, all's looking good, and along the journey, more families have joined them, including the Murphys, the Breens, and German immigrant Louis Kesselberg, along with his wife and child. His wife Elizabeth actually gave birth on the trail. Several people who actually joined them were already sick, wanting to make last-ditch attempts to make California, hoping the air would heal them, wanting to try to live their life before the end. As all of this is going on, Lansford Hastings is still parked along the route, trying to convince anyone who comes his way to take his awesome, cool new cutoff. It's going to save them loads of time, he says. He even starts writing letters to people along the route, leaving them at stopping points to be picked up. And on the 12th of July, the Donna Reed party receives one of these. Basically, the letter warns them to expect opposition from the Mexican authorities in California and to find safety in numbers. Hastings also says that he's going to meet them at Fort Bridger to guide them along his new route. It's so much better than the other one. The entire party rests at Little Sandy River until July 20th, during which time a lot of debate is going on about whether or not they're going to continue with their proposed route, so the standard one past Snake River, or they're going to try this fun new one. Most of the wagon trail decides they're going to continue along the normal route as planned, but the Donna Reed party trailing the back decide to follow Hastings' advice, and they separate from the rest and head towards Fort Bridger. At this point in time, there's actually a bit of a rivalry going on between James Reed and George Donner, both of them sort of vying for the leadership role. Reed was kind of the shoe in for the role, he had the age, the military experience on his side, but a lot of the group thought that he was very snobby and aristocratic. He was also Irish born, which probably contributed to the negative feelings. Whereas Donner was peaceful and American born, people liked him more, so he actually got voted in as the leader, not that it would really make much difference. 
It's also probably important to mention at this point that the party had very little knowledge or experience when it came to Native American people. And they were also generally just very inexperienced when it came to this kind of travel, especially considering that they had so many children aboard the wagons. But the Donna Reed party knew they were clueless, so when they had the carrot of a shorter route dangled in front of them, this journey coming to an end a lot sooner, they took it. Other people did try to warn them about what they were trying to do, so a Kentucky newspaper editor called Edwin Bryan actually sent them letters trying to talk them out of it, but the Donna Reed party never received them. In later testimony, Bryant expressed suspicion that his letters had been intercepted and deliberately hidden. And the man he suspected of hiding the letters was called Jim Bridger, who ran the supply station at Fort Bridger. I can only assume it was named after himself or his family. He greets the party when they arrive and he tells them to expect an easy trip through the cutoff with no hostile Native American people. He also says it would shorten their journey by over 300 miles now, although as we've established, it was actually longer by 125 miles. Bridget also says they're not going to have to worry about finding water, although they are going to have to cross a dry lake bed at one point. Now, James Reed is a big fan of everything he's hearing from Bridger. He's advocating for this cutoff, although others in the party are having cold feet. They're now thinking, why are they trying something new when the Snake River route is well-traveled and known to be safe? Are they being stupid? Tamsin Donner, the wife of George Donner, is reported to be gloomy, sad, and dispirited at the decision to take the Hastings cutoff. She thinks Hastings is a selfish adventurer, although no one in the party actually even really had a chance to meet him up to this point. Just days before the Donna Reed group arrived at Fort Bridger, Hastings had left with another group, the Harlan Youngs, and he was days ahead of them on the trail. In his book, From Oregon and California in 1848, fellow pioneer Jesse Quinn Thornton would say that Hastings was the Baron Munchausen of travellers, Baron Munchausen being a fictional character known for dramatic and untruthful stories, the same person who inspired the name for Munchausen Syndrome, so a little fun fact for you there. Despite people in the party being so unsure about this, on July 31st, 1846, the Donner Party departed from Fort Bridger, joined now by the McCutcheon family and Jean-Baptiste Trudeau from New Mexico, 74 people in 20 wagons. But within days, it was very clear that this was not going to be an easy journey. Hastings had lied. There's barely even a defined path to follow, as compared to the very well-walked route of the Oregon Trail. They found notes pinned to trees from Hastings ahead of them on the journey, directing them, telling them where to go. On August 6th, they find a letter telling them to stop and wait to be shown yet another route. A small group of men, including Reed, ride ahead to find Hastings, encountering awful terrain and a route that would just be outright dangerous for a wagon to pass through. Reed eventually found Hastings along the south shore of Great Salt Lake, making them accompany him back part way to show them this new route. And he only shows them, he actually doesn't physically guide them as they were promised in his letters. Still, there's conversation as to whether or not they should risk this new route. Some party members want to head back to Fort Bridger, they hadn't gone too far yet, they could have turned back if they wanted to. But they vote among themselves and they decide to persevere. They had so many opportunities to change their mind. Heading down this route, the progress slows down to a mile and a half a day. A day. I mean, I can walk a mile and a half in half an hour. The route is blocked at every single turn. The men have to physically remove obstacles from the trail, trees, boulders, etc., in order for them to even be able to move forward. It takes them six days to travel just eight miles. Some of the wagons have to be abandoned on the way, and as you can imagine, morale at this point is at an all-time low. Blame is being thrown in every direction, but mostly at Lansford Hastings and James Reed, because he's the one who wanted to do this route. As the party travels across the Wasatch Range of the Rocky Mountains, they're joined by the Graves Party, bringing the total up by 13 more people to 87. But then on August 25th, they lost another member, Luke Halloran, to consumption, taking them back down to 86. 
By August 20th, the party can see Great Salt Lake from where they are on the Wasatch Range, but they have to remain traveling through it for two more weeks. At this point, provisions are starting to run very low, particularly for the poorer families among them. It became very clear that they needed to reach a restock point and they needed to reach it soon. They needed to reach California soon. In late August, the party finds another letter from Hastings telling them that there were two days and two nights of difficult travel up ahead, as if what they'd already been through wasn't difficult enough. But he wasn't wrong. The party decides to rest for 36 hours before they start on the journey up a 300 meter mountain. They reach the peak with one member reporting what they see ahead of them as one of the most inhospitable places on earth, just the Great Salt Plains. Everyone's exhausted, they're about to run out of water, even the oxen pulling the wagons are done. But now they had to cross the Great Salt Lake Desert. As the word desert would suggest, the heat was completely inhospitable, causing many members of the group to just hallucinate. The desert sand was moist, uneven and sticky, the wagon wheels sinking as they tried to cross. After three days in the desert, the water was now completely gone and they started to abandon their wagons and animals. Many of the oxen actually broke free and just ran into the distance in search of water. The wagons were severely damaged, the crossing that was supposed to take two days ended up taking six. Somehow though, they didn't lose any human lives in this time, but it was on the horizon. They rest at the base of Pilot Peak for several days after this, where they take inventory of their stock, finding that they don't have anywhere near enough for the 600 mile trek ahead of them. So two of the healthiest young men, William McCutcheon and Charles Stanton, are sent ahead to Sutter's Fort in California to get supplies and bring them back. John Sutter was known to be very generous to travellers, if they had any chance, this was going to be it. These two healthy young men could move a lot faster on their horses than the entire group could. Meanwhile, the Donner Party manages to cross the next 40 miles with little issue. By the 26th September, they managed to make it back onto the original route to the Humboldt River, but the detour had added a further month onto their journey, a month they hadn't allowed for. From here, they travel along the river, but in mid-October, they encounter Paiute Native Americans, where it's said that oxen and horses are stolen. Tensions are running high, with everyone blaming Reed for what had happened. And here is where the next death occurs. A pair of wagons get tangled together and John Cinder beats Reed's ox in anger. He then turns on to Reed himself, beating him with a whip handle and when Margaret Reed tries to stop it, she also gets whipped. In retaliation, Reed stabs Cinder in the collarbone with a knife. He dies, murdered. Now at this point, they're west of the Continental Divide and therefore they're not under American law. George Donner is the leader here and it should have been up to him to decide on a punishment, but he was traveling a full day up ahead, so the group have to debate. Some were calling for Reed to be hanged, but instead he was just exiled, he was sent off without his family. He departed the next morning supposedly unarmed, but his stepdaughter Virginia gives him a rifle and food. Reed eventually catches up with the Donners up ahead where things are moving faster, but by this point they've lost nearly 100 oxen and cattle, they've barely any food or water left. However, they do encounter the Truckee River and therefore river water. And then the food arrives from Sutter's Fort, William and Charles arrive back with supplies. Things are finally looking up. But then William Foster shoots William Pike dead by accident whilst loading a gun, so more people are dying. Now at this point, they're in autumn and they're up against the clock and they know it. They need to reach the Sierra Nevada mountains before the snow arrives. The wagons somehow need to climb the nearly vertical 300 meter slope to reach Truckee Lake. Most of the group were able to make it, but George Donner's wagon axle broke and so the Donners fell behind the rest of the party, 22 people in total. They had to stay behind whilst the wagon was repaired, but whilst cutting timber for the new axle, George Donner cut his hand very badly, causing yet more delays. And then on November 4th, the snow starts in a storm that lasts eight days. At this point, very little food from Sutter's Fort remains and the oxen begin to die. 60 members of the group are at Truckee Lake and they're now forced to set up for the winter. But the lake is too frozen, they can't fish properly, there's no food anywhere, so they turn to eating the dead oxen, but the oxen were starved themselves, there was no meat on them. 
And as the snow keeps falling, the carcasses are buried anyway. The party's diet throughout this winter consisted of ox hide and ox and horse bones that are boiled repeatedly to make soup. They build cabins to reside in for the season. In one cabin, there's an ox hide rug that the children pick apart and roast to eat. The party catch and eat the mice. They eat anything that's even vaguely edible. And making this even harder, two thirds of the camp's inhabitants were children. So that was the main camp up at Truckee Lake, whilst the Donners are stuck further down the trail at Alder Creek. News eventually arrives at the lake that Jacob Donner and three of their hired men have died. George Donner's hand has still not healed and now it's become infected. There are only four able-bodied men able to work at the Donner camp. They construct a camp building shelters from tents, quilts, buffalo robes. There was nothing they could do except wait for the worst of the weather to pass and hope that it passed quickly. Back up at the lake with the Reed party, they're facing starvation, but every time they try to send parties out for food, they're forced to return. They fashion snowshoes out of ox bows and hide, and on December 16th, 1846, a party of 17 men, women and children set out. They're going to die if they stay at the camp, they're gonna die if they go, so they might as well die trying. The group become known in history as the Forlorn Hope. They take six days worth of rations with them and other supplies and head towards Bear Valley. Charles Berger and 10 year old William Murphy turn back early on. Charles Stanton is forced to remain behind several days in and his remains are found later that year. The group quickly become lost and after a number of days without food, it's suggested that somebody needs to volunteer to die to feed the others. They play with the idea of a jewel or a lottery, but eventually nature decides for them. There's a blizzard and an animal handler called Antonio and Franklin Graves both die. Patrick Dolan, who originally suggested that they all eat each other, eventually turns delirious and he runs into the woods naked. He then returns and dies soon after. The group begin to eat his flesh straight from his body. They strip the muscles and organs from the bodies and they dry them to store for the days ahead but that's soon eaten, so they turn to taking apart their snowshoes and eat the ox hide instead. One by one, each of the forlorn hope is dying, leaving only seven of the original 17 alive. The group actually had two Native American guides at this point with them called Luis and Salvador, which is their Catholic conversion names, not their birth names, and there is discussion within the group over killing them, but they're warned and they manage to sneak away. However, they struggle to survive alone and soon the group catches up to them, finding them barely holding on to life. So William Foster shoots them both and their bodies are butchered. The murder of these two men was not kept a secret. Everyone knew what happened, but Foster faced no repercussions. The lives of Native Americans seemed to matter very little to the party. However, just a few days later, they came across a Native American settlement who provided them with food to eat, likely saving their lives, the irony. A rescue party actually finds them on January 17th, and during this time, there is also a rescue attempt for those stranded in Sierra Nevada. At this time though, most of the military in California is already involved in the Mexican-American War. Communications and roads are blocked throughout the region. There's barely any people left to respond to calls for help. The survivors of the Flawn Hope create a petition for the US Navy to go in and help those at Truckee Lake, with two local newspapers reporting the cannibalism they were forced to turn to, which very much could have gone in two different directions, but actually it led to sympathy. Through this, $1,300 are raised to organise relief efforts. On February 4th, the rescue party begins from Sacramento Valley with seven people forging onto the lake. When they eventually reach the people there, Mrs. Murphy emerged asking, are you men from California or do you come from heaven? By this point, 13 people had died over the winter and many of the living pioneers seemed emotionally unstable, but they began the extraction process of a number of people. Now the rescuers couldn't take everyone, but they took who they could at this point, and mostly they took the people who were healthiest. When the first relief party reaches Snowdrift, Patty and Tommy Reed are too weak, too sick to cross, and nobody is strong enough to carry them, so Margaret Reed has to take her two older children with her, whilst her two sick, youngest children have to travel right back to the lake. 
Margaret forces a rescuer named Aquila Glover to promise to go back for her children. And when the children return to the camp, the Green family refuse to allow them into their cabin until Glover comes back with more food, at which point they begrudgingly allow them back in. They were willing to allow these children just to freeze to death outside. So on their way in, the rescue party had built cash stations along the rescue route with supplies, but when they reach the first station, they find it's been ravaged by animals, meaning they have no food or water for four days. As a result, John Denton and baby Ada Kesselberg die. The children are particularly weak and there are fears they're not gonna make it with the amount of physical exertion that's required. The children resort to eating the buckskin fringe from the rescuer's trousers and their shoelaces. When they eventually reach a food store, William Hook breaks into the stores and literally gorges himself until he dies. So desperate, so hungry, he doesn't know when to stop and he literally eats until he can't fit any more in, he dies. In late February, a second rescue party is organized to get more people from the lake. And when they arrive, they're amazed to find that no one else has died. However, at this time, two rescuers also arrive at Alder Creek where the Donner party have been stranded. They see someone carrying a human leg, throwing it into a hole containing the dismembered body of Jacob Donner. Now Jacob's wife refused to eat him, but his children did eat his organs. Tamsin Donner was found to be alive and well, and George was also alive, but his hand infection had spread and now his shoulder was gangrenous. The second relief party are able to take 17 people with them, 14 of whom are children, which leaves just five people at Truckee Lake, Lewis Kesselberg, Mrs. Murphy and Simon Murphy, and their two young children. At Alder Creek, Tamsin Donna stays with George after it's explained that a third party will be there soon, as she decides to keep her daughters with her. Now they all know that this rescue isn't necessarily life-saving. Most people just didn't have enough energy for the rest of the journey. It literally killed them. Isaac Donner freezes to death. James Reed nearly dies. In early March, the Breen and Gray's family are so weak that the rescue party are forced to leave them behind in what becomes known as starved camp. Elizabeth and her son Franklin Graves both die and the rest of the party resort to eating their bodies to survive. It is truly incredible what lengths you anti will go to to survive, that sort of like inbuilt instinct to do whatever you can to stay alive, even though it's probably not in your best interest. After the second rescue efforts, three members of the relief party actually stayed behind, so one at Truckee Lake and two at Alder Creek. Two of these men not being able to cope with the conditions make plans to return to California, where Tamsin Donna arranges for them to take her daughters, Eliza, Georgia and Frances with them for $500 cash. They agree, but end up just taking the girls up to Truckee Lake instead, where they leave them in a cabin with Lewis Kesselberg. They also pass through starved camp on their way back to California, but they don't stop to help. By mid-March, only nine people remain alive between Truckee Lake and Alder Creek. Tamsin Donna refuses to leave George, even though by now she's heard that her girls are up at the lake. And when the third rescue party arrives, they can only take a few people with them, including the Donna girls. At some point in March, George Donna ends up dying, so Tamsin Donna sets out from Alder Creek on her own. She manages to get to Kessberg's cabin, but dies in the night. On April 10th, almost a month after the third rescue effort, a salvage party is sent back to recover belongings to be sold for the orphan Donna children. They didn't expect to find anyone alive, but to their surprise, Lewis Kesselberg survived. According to his testimony, Mrs. Lavinia Murphy died a week after the third rescue party left. Tamsin Donna arrived at his cabin, but died in the night. However, they find a pot of human flesh in his cabin, along with all of George Donner's belongings and $250 in gold. Importantly, Kesselberg was a German immigrant and not American born, so already people were less inclined to believe him, but he was found among the mutilated remains of his companions. Although it was common knowledge that a lot of the party had turned to cannibalism to survive, when Kesselberg was found, they threatened to lynch him, although this may have been to do with the money that was found with him as well. Kesselberg was the last person rescued, and with that, no one else remained at the lake, which has now been renamed Donner Lake. By July 1847, the news of the tragic Donner Party expedition reaches New York City. 
Now this could have been a very sensitive subject because as we discussed at the beginning of this episode, the US at this time was really trying to promote this westward migration. They wanted people out in California. And this wasn't gonna be doing a lot to convince people to do so. So journalists twisted it. The Donner Party were heroes. California was clearly worth making such huge sacrifices for. Some outlets would write about the cannibalism in graphic detail. Look how much these people were willing to risk to achieve the American dream. Also, gore equals views. Always has, always will. Their twisting on the story didn't quite do the job though. There was a decrease in Western migration in the following years, but there was also the Mexican-American war going on, which probably didn't help. But then the California gold rush happened and 25,000 migrants make the journey in 1849. So all was well. Over the following years, bones, artifacts, and the cabins used by the families would be discovered by more people attempting this pass. Remember by this point, they were back on the normal route. They were back on the Oregon Trail. They were just a month later, a month and a half later than they should have been. So they got caught in the winter. In 1891, a cache of money is discovered, likely hidden by Mrs. Graves, who wanted to go back for it later, but obviously she died. Hastings received a lot of backlash, death threats even, for his role in these events, but someone who encountered him reported that, of course, he could say nothing but that he was very sorry and that he meant well. Out of 87 members of the party, 48 people survived. All families, apart from the Reed and Breen families, were destroyed. Many children were orphaned. Of the animals, only three mules survived. In the aftermath, the Reeds settle in San Jose, with two of the Donner children coming to live with them. The other Donner children are taken in by an older couple near Sutter's Fort. James Reed is in the right place at the right time during the California Gold Rush, and he becomes rich like he always wanted. The Reeds are also said to be the only family that didn't have to resort to eating human flesh. In May 1847, Virginia Reed wrote a letter to her cousin reading, I have not wrote to you half the troubles we have had, but I have wrote enough to let you know that you don't know what trouble is. But thank God we've all got through and the only family that did not eat human flesh. We have left everything, but I don't care for that. We have got through with our lives. But don't let this letter dishearten anybody. Never take no cutoffs and hurry along as fast as you can. Lewis Kesselberg, the last survivor, actually brings a defamation case against many members of the relief party who accused him of murdering Townsend Donner. He receives one dollar in damages but ends up having to pay the court costs, so actually loses money. He's ripped to shreds by the newspapers who claim that he prefers human flesh over cattle. It's nice to see that a lot of journalism has barely changed in nearly 200 years. This story achieved notoriety over the following years, with everyone wanting a piece of the survivors. That is not meant to be a pun, that's awful. The appeal of this case to readers was that this happened to regular people, regular families, it happened to children. And the cannibalism also helped. People are very drawn to darkness, to the unthinkable. Historian George R. Stewart wrote, The cannibalism, although it might almost be called a minor episode, has become in the popular mind the chief fact to be remembered about the Donner Party. For a taboo always lures with this great strength as it repels. By 1854, the cabins became a tourist attraction and in the 1880s, they begin to promote a monument to mark the site. In 1934, the site became a California historical landmark. The Donna Memorial State Park was established in 1927, consisting of 11 acres surrounding the monument. As of 2003, the park receives about 200,000 visitors every year. The state of California justifies memorializing the event as an isolated and tragic incident of American history that has been transformed into a major folk epic. Over the years, the survivors' lives all come to an end. The final survivor to die was Isabella Breen, who was only a year old in the winter of 1846. She died on March 25th, 1935. The party's harrowing journey is one that could have been avoided. This was the result of manifest destiny, poor planning, bad weather, and most importantly, a series of very bad decisions. Along the way, this could have been avoided at so many points. But that's the thing with life, you never know what's around the corner. The butterfly effect is truly a real thing. 
But this fate was probably set in stone before any of their lives had even begun. America's need to expand, need to follow the apparent instructions of God. If it hadn't been these people, the Reeds and the Donners and the other families, it would have been others. Lansford Hastings was always going to get someone on his route eventually. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. I hope you found this one as interesting as I did. If you've made it all the way to the end of the video, please don't forget to interact with this in any way you can. Like it, comment, subscribe to my channel if you're not already. Maybe even become a channel member if you feel so inclined. Keeping this channel going is always a collaborative effort. I literally couldn't do this without you guys watching every week. So thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.